Hi everyone, welcome to Open Democracy's weekly live discussion. I'm Nandini Archer. Um, I am Global Commissioning Editor with Open Democracy. I'm based in uh, London on our gender team, doing mainly feminist investigative journalism uh, and telling stories of feminist resistance. Um, and we have a weekly live discussion um, like the one we're about to have. And I think this is gonna be the best one yet. <laughs> so um, we want this, to, this conversation to involve as many of you as possible. Um, so particularly thank you for all those who submitted their questions and comments ahead of time. We're gonna try and address as many of them as we can. Uh, so if you're joining us on Zoom and you have a question or a comment for us, click on the chat icon um, at the bottom of your screen uh, and type into the chat window. People who are watching on Facebook can also put their questions in comments there and my colleague will get to them. Um, so this week's topic is, how is the British Police Crackdown Bill a threat to democracy? So the Police Crime, Se Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill creates, a new, um, creates new stop and search powers, allows the police to put more conditions on protests and threatens gypsy and traveler rights to roam among other things. Um, it's been met with mass protests um, and so today we're discussing whether this <laughs> bill is a threat to our human rights and whether there is any stopping it now. Um, so before we kick off, uh, I want to introduce the panel. Uh, we have Gracie Bradley, who is Interim Director of Liberty. Uh, we have Moya Lothian-McLean, who is uh, Politics Editor at Geldam. We have Luke Smith, who is founder of GRT, Gypsy, Roma and Traveller Socialists. Uh, and we have Zara Sultana, who is a La uh, Labour MP. So uh, let's really uh, get started with some general background questions to understand what this bill is and what's so concerning about it. Um, and to start off, Gracie, you'll have quite a broad overview of the human rights implications of this bill. Uh, so let me go to you first. Why are we talking about this bill and what exactly is so scary about it? Thanks, Nandini. Um, so yeah, the policing bill, and I'm really glad that everyone has been calling it the police crackdown bill because that is what it is. Um, it's an all out assault on human rights on many fronts. You know, we've heard a lot about the provisions on protest, which I'll come to in a minute. But what I really don't want us to lose is the breadth of this threat um, to a range of communities. And that's why I'm really glad that you pulled this panel together this evening. So on policing, first of all, this bill will extend, expand stop and search powers. It's gonna make it easier for police to harass people with prior convictions, and that's going to disproportionately affect young black men. It also establishes a serious violence reduction duty. And this is basically a prevent style duty for serious violence. And what this is going to do is encourage people, public servants and public service providers to share private data on people most likely on the basis of crude stereotypes. And that is going to leave people with fewer and fewer places to turn to for support. And again, that's going to disproportionately affect racialized and working class communities. And finally, on the policing front, we see that this bill is gonna make it easier to establish more secure schools, meaning more capacity to put young people in prison. And this is also gonna be racist, it will be ableist, and of course, it's gonna disproportionately affect working class youth. And I know we'll talk more about the bill's impact on Gypsy Roma and Traveller communities, but in a nutshell, the bill is going to hand the police more powers. Most police have said they don't want these powers to enforce against what they call unauthorised encampments and to criminalise trespass. And that's going to disrupt and criminalise Gypsy Roma and Traveller communities. And finally, the part that I know that lots of people have been talking about, this bill is going to make it easier to impose conditions on protest at lower thresholds while raising the penalties for breaching them. And essentially it aims to hand the police way more powers that they do not need to effectively extinguish protest rights. So that's the broad sweep of this bill. And I would just say it has to be set in the broader context of the government war on accountability mechanisms. So at the same time as the government trying to clamp down on protest and silence us that way, it's also trying to water down our Human Rights Act. It's trying to curtail judicial review, which is a legal process that means that public bodies can be held to account. It's tried to sideline Parliament through prorogation and throughout the pandemic, 
And now here we are with this bill, this crackdown on our protest rights. So we have to see it within that broad context of a crackdown on our right to speak out and our right to hold the state and public authorities to account. So that's the doom and gloom. I do have chirpier things to say later, but I will leave it there. Thanks so much, Gracie. That was a, a really beautiful overview of a, of a very ugly bill. Um, and so uh, next really to Zara then, building on this, could you explain um, what your position on this bill was and, and is and why? Of course. So this bill in particular was something that was demanded um, by the Home Secretary um, after the, the, the huge protests we've seen in recent times. We've seen Extinction Rebellion protests, we've seen Black Lives Matter protests. And there was a lobbying that took place between the Metropolitan Police and the government calling for powers to crack down on protests. In this specific bill, there was no white paper or green paper, which you usually expect before a bill is presented in Parliament or a draft bill. Nothing of the sort. And it was published just six days before uh, MPs had a chance to vote on it. And that goes against usual convention that we expect um, to allow scrutiny. And I opposed it because... I've seen, like so many others, a huge trend that has um, been part of this government's trajectory of ascending into authoritarianism. We've had uh, various bills, including the Spy Cops bill, which gives the power of you know, the power to state agents to commit rape, torture and murder, the Overseas Operations Bill, where the government effectively wanted to decriminalise torture and crimes. And while they have actually backtracked on some of that legislation by exempting genocide and torture, no longer exempting genocide and torture, um, you can see where this government is going. And it, like Gracie said, it's just a full blown attack on our civil liberties, both here domestically and abroad. And for me, that is obviously a huge concern. And I think it's really important to note that initially the Labour Party position on this legislation was to abstain. And it was because of people protesting, going out into the streets, led by Sisters on Car, um, that we were able to change our position. I would have voted against it regardless, but I think it's really important to show that it was the power of protest that led to that change in party position from the Labour leadership. Great, thank you so much um, for that. And, and so uh, now to Luke, um, a big part of this bill, of course, um, is its focus on, on gypsy and traveller communities. Um, and you've said before that it, it seeks to criminalise your community's um, very way of life. Could you explain this a bit more and expand um, to those who might not quite understand that connection? OK, yeah, so I'm happy to explain this. So um, 15 to 20 percent of our communities still live nomadically. So 99 percent of human history, pretty much. Um, it was the norm to be nomadic. It's only a relatively recent in sort of um, the history of humankind that we live in houses, we farm the land, we work for aristocrats, we do this, that and the other. Um, and there's two communities that are mainly affected by this, and that's Irish travellers. So they're native to these sort of islands. They're Celtic people. They have a Celtic language. And then people like me, Romani gypsies, who are originally from India, um, who came here about 500 years ago. But this, you know, surprise, surprise, this isn't the first time we've experienced this sort of discrimination. It's not, it's, you know, it's not the first time we've experienced pogroms in this country and had our assets seized um had our children removed from us and had us deported to all the colonies and things like that you know the last tyrant that came along was henry the eighth with the egyptians act of 1530 and pretty patel feeds into that perfectly if you look at that historic act and you look at pretty patel's act very similar i'll explain how it really affects us so it's our historic way of life remember people have lived like this for hundreds of years before it was trailers um it was wagons and vados and you know my family have lived in those you know forever basically i now live in a house my family live in a house now but um, that's not the point. Um, so this bill criminalises a community, the, the most vulnerable and the most poor in our community, by the way. Um, it suggests fines of up to £2,500, three-month prison sentences, the seizure of assets and goods. Um, and there's some, you know, there's a, there's a wider picture to this. So um, the wider picture is, is that we experience police brutality on a massive scale. When you see Dale Farm, the, you know, the pictures aren't that, that dissimilar from the Met battering people at the vigil. They're not dissimilar to Bristol and everywhere else. But we've been doing that. This is normal operating, um, you know, for us. That's what that's what we sort of experience all the time. Now, this bill on the seizure of assets gives those same police officers that batter us and, you know, drag an Irish traveller woman who's epileptic and pregnant across a common until she has an epileptic fit. Um, these same 
same police officers that let their dog almost tear a man's leg off, these same police officers now have the power at their discretion to seize our assets if we have the intent to reside. So it's the racist police officers that now have that power over our lives. They can come and seize our goods and they get to make that decision. Now, the worst part of this bill that affects our community isn't actually written in the bill. Um, it's a consequence of, you know, the three month prison sentences, because, you know, if you put somebody's parents in prison for three months, what happens to the children? You know, they get forcibly adopted into the social care system and, you know, child care and things like that. And this isn't the first time this state has done that. Um, we have a long history in this country of forcibly adopting gypsy and traveller children and putting them with non-gypsy and traveller families. Um, and it's a form of forced assimilation. So that's the most worrying part of the bill. Like I say, these people don't have a lot. These are This is a form of homelessness that they're criminalising. Um, and... And, and, and it goes on to the backdrop. If they really wanted to solve this issue, this wouldn't even be anywhere near the Home Secretary. It wouldn't be anywhere near um, the Home Office and it wouldn't be anywhere near the justice system. What it needs to be with is with the Ministry of How Housing, Communities and Local Government providing sites for our community to live on or um, you know, having a strategy of negotiated stopping so these people could stop in one area and you know, be provided all the services that normal people, you know, non gypsy and traveller people take for granted, bins, toilets, uh, you know, access to clean water, which some of our community haven't even had access to over the pandemic. Um, um, in the sixth richest country in the world. But I'll kind of leave it there. But yeah, like I say, the, I'll, I'll finish on this. There's a shortage of transit sites. There's a shortage of permanent sites. There's even a bigger shortage of negotiated stopping. So it means you are criminalising a form of homelessness. And what happens when they take our vehicles and stuff and it's sat in the justice system for over a year? It means they become conventionally homeless. Um, I don't call it the police and crimes and sentence bill. I don't call it, you know... Um, what the previous bill, I call it the pogroms bill, because that's what this is. This, these are pogroms and don't let anybody tell you any different. And at some point, everybody's going to have to choose a side in this. Um, but yeah, I'll finish with that. Thank you for having me in the first place. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Um, and so next to Moya um, and, and both both Luke and, and Zara mentioned this, um, many people this bill was wasn't really part of public discussion it wasn't really on the radar for, for much media for instance um, and then the Sarah Everard vigil happened in Clapham um, South London and suddenly kill the bill was everywhere um, how is this bill connected to that moment and what happened there well I mean I think it's several ways I think first of all obviously you have the direct um, fact that we got to see what police further criminalizing protest would look like. So you had the images from Clapham, which came out where the police were there, they were so heavy handed. Uh, they said that the protest was illegal and couldn't happen. So they cracked down on it. And that's what will continue to happen because criminalizing protest is not gonna stop protest. It's just going to increase the level of violence. But I also think that it, it was, you know, the, the Kill the Bill movement is linked to Sarah Everard because it, it Sarah Everard's death and the man charged with her death currently is a metropolitan serving, well, he was a metropolitan serving police officer. And I think unconsciously people automatically drew that link in that this bill seeks to equip the police with so much more power. It seeks to make the whole model even more punitive. It wants to charge every sort of like social ill to the hands of the police for them to deal with. And Sarah Everard's you know, the man, the man charged with her death, being a serving police officer, people suddenly thought, why are we automatically putting this trust in the police to do that? Maybe there's something else that could happen here. And I think it suddenly woke up that the police aren't a neutral force. And for a lot of us, we already knew that. But for others, I think it was it was a bit of a shock to realise that the police aren't this neutral force. It is it's an institution that has been found as she racist, you know, since she's sexist, but it's also made up of individuals that subscribe to that sort of institutional violence that is present within the police. And that suddenly rushing through a bill that would give them so much more power, especially over marginalised communities in so many different ways was you know, horrendous. The thought of that was just so terrifying that we've seen this massive coalition come about as a result of that. And that is heartening, but I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit more later. Brilliant, thank you. And so I'm gonna go um, back to Gracie because one of the questions we got from the audience ahead of uh, this discussion uh, was whether you could explain a bit more about other areas of the bill that haven't caught um, that public attention. And this person in particular said that the, the, the kind of threat to protests has been increasingly talked about, um, but wondered whether there are any other parts that the general public should be more aware of and whether you could break that down for them. 
Yeah, well, I think Luke's already done a pretty good job on some on some aspects of the bill. And, you know, I would return to those aspects around policing specifically, um, because I think, you know, Zara, you mentioned the lack of consultation and the very annoying and dangerous thing about this bill is that it's an amalgamation of several initiatives from over several years into one mega carceral punitive bit of legislation. And so this thing about serious violence reduction orders, that was something that was in the water when Sajid Javid was Home Secretary. And that's something that was consulted on. Um, and obviously Liberty said, this is prevent, but for knife crime, rather than so-called extremism, why would you do this again? Um, of course, the government was at the same time in the process of stitching up the so-called independent review of prevent. So, you know, it's, it's all linked. But I think this thing about the serious violence reduction orders and the additional stop and search powers, um, it's really, really important because it's a real slap in the face um, to everything that people who went out to say Black Lives Matter um, have been calling for. Um, it's not just the crackdown on protest. It's also the, we hear you saying you don't want to be oppressed by the state anymore. By the way, we're going to hand the police more stop and search powers, right? That's really insulting. Um, and it's really divisive. Uh, and I think the, that part of the bill is specifically about allowing the police to stop and search without reasonable grounds people who've had prior convictions. So that's people who may already have been profiled in some way, who've already interacted with the criminal punishment system in a way that was likely to be ableist and classist and racially disproportionate. And that's all done. And they're trying to rebuild their lives. And the fact that they have a prior conviction for something to do with a knife or serious violence, the police can stop and search them just for that. They don't, they don't need reasonable grounds. So that's really trapping people. Um, there is, it's very difficult to see a way out of that for people. And it also turns the presumption of innocence completely on its head. Because, you know, there are people who believe that prisons are there for rehabilitation. I'm not one of them. But, you know, if you believe that prison is there for somebody to be punished, and then society says, okay, you're done, you've had a chance to reform, go on and live your life. This stop and search power is the opposite. It says you have a conviction before, you may have been punished already, however, we're going to continue to harass you. So I think it's really important to understand the impact of those proposed stop and search powers on marginalised people. And similarly, how counterproductive this new serious violence reduction duty is going to be. Because if you are in some kind of trouble and you do need somewhere to go, what happens when you can't trust your doctor, you can't trust your teacher, you can't trust your housing officer, you can't trust your youth worker, because all of them have been told you need to share information on this person if you suspect X, Y, and Z. So, and when you look at those provisions against the fact that the bill will massively expand capacity to incarcerate people for longer, you see just how trapping a spiral it is. So I think those parts of the bill, you know, they're not sexy. Um, I am not sure that we will get cross-party opposition to them, but I think they say an awful lot about what the state thinks about people who make mistakes, how we should treat them, whether anybody is redeemable, whether those people are really human, and, and whether we support people or whether we kind of just shunt people to one side and we say you're a lost cause. It really says something about what the state thinks of certain people, so yeah. Great, thank you. And and um, kind of connected to that, one of the questions I got um, ahead of this session was, um, and, and this goes to anyone on the panel, whoever wants to answer it, um, why why do you think in memory of Stephen Lawrence it's so important to re resist this bill? I mean, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, it's in memory of every single person who's ever been um, let down by the police in any sort of way, whether that's directly is due to deaths in police custody, whether that's simply being criminalised by them. Stephen Lawrence was let down, obviously, because the police institutional racism prevented his murder being solved, caused his family to be infiltrated and surveilled by police officers who were meant to be um, guiding and protecting them at the time. Um, I also just wanted to add to Gracie's point earlier about things within the bill that we might have missed um, and we might not be aware of. So alongside the sort of like additional stop and search powers, there's, I don't know if we mentioned data sharing, 
So there's this, this bill would create and impose on local authorities um, and education authorities, health authorities, et cetera, um, to share data with the police and other authorities to prevent that serious violence or becoming the victim of serious violence. But as we've seen in the past, then like essential services like healthcare or local authorities responsible for say social housing, um, it means that vulnerable populations are way less likely to turn to them for support um, and help. So, you know, you can see in examples of, say, like migrant women tied to spies, spousal visas who are afraid to report domestic violence um, because of home office data sharing. Um, data sharing really causes harm and it further criminalizes. You see it with the gangs matrix and predictive policing. So that's a massive one as well. Um, and they also want to expand remote justice. So uh, it would enable the use of audio and video for like a much wider range of criminal proceedings than is already in place, um, which they found that it leads to a much higher risk of unfair trials for um, defendants or who are particularly neurodivergent or disabled um, and had had lead to a likelihood of harsher sentences. So I know that diverged a bit away from your initial question, but I wanted to add that in because I felt like it was really important. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And if anyone else has anything to add, feel free to, to jump in. Can I just quickly add something on the back of that? I just wanted to say that politicians keep coming along and saying the Human Rights Act is going to protect us. And it's really, I'm finding it very irritating at the minute, especially human rights lawyers and the rest of it. Because this Home Secretary has has declared her intent to lessen those that coverage of the Human Rights Act and reform it and change it and everything else. So this idea that, you know, my community is going to be saved by the Human Rights Act is frankly a disgrace. And somebody that studied at Oxford should know bloody better. Um, so that's all I wanted to say on that. Um, I just thought that was a, a quick one. I also wanted to add that this idea that, you know, we're going to have this electoral politics thing and they're all going to come along and save us. Get that out of your heads now. Um, because that's gone. That's too far gone for that. And as much as I think Zara's amazing and everything like that, there isn't enough of Zara's in Parliament. Therefore, we can't rely on, on that. But what I wanted to say is that the Labour Party as well has created consent for the abuse of my community, just as the Tories have with their leaflets and everything else. And I just wanted to allude to a tiny little microcosm of what's happening across the whole country in Warrington. Um, what the problem with Warrington is, is that there's a Labour council there who's handing out leaflets saying that our community is saying we're incursions, invasions and having language about us like we're vermin. Right. But they're sitting on two million pounds for a transit site. So what they're saying is, is that we've created the problem. We can't be bothered to fix it and build this transit site. Um, but we're still going to hand out leaflets to incite racial violence and racial hatred. And the Conservatives and uh, lots of councils and from all parties all around the country have been doing this. And that's what's created consent for this sort of sort of thing. And I, I think that's awful. And I think people need to know that that isn't OK. Um, another part of the bill that really concerns people like me is the secure schools bit about incarcerating our youth because our youth don't need more prison our youth don't need more carceral state solution what we need is grassroots boxing grassroots sports everything else youth clubs you know investment get access to employment um and social economic you know improvement basically um and this bill uh, does that but i i just wanted to point out that you you really need to now start getting on the side of doing something in the streets and everything else because trade unions going oh we can't break the law it isn't good enough because eventually you will be breaking the law whether you like it or not because they will make you breaking the law most of our community weren't breaking the law before this bill was coming out right but we will be breaking it afterwards so you just keep that in mind that things change and once we're dealt with and we've been picked off of the pack um, other people will be too. And let's not forget that disabled people have been abused for the last 10 years and thrown under the bus. So, and it can happen to anybody. So I just want to make that clear. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> and, and just to add to um, the points that have already been made, especially linking it to the Sarah, Sarah Everard case, um, when this, the, the news came out about how she had died, it was just fascinating to see how there were more politicians still calling for more police. Um, especially with this case, especially with uh, what we know um, and what um, the individual has been charged with. And I think in politics, there's this de facto position that, oh, when it comes to violence against women and girls, when it comes to racism, when it comes to all of these different issues, uh, let's just invest in more kind of carceral solutions rather than looking at social and economic 
uh, causes, uh, rather than looking at the fact that uh, disproportionately women are on the minimum wage, um, are in situations where they are financially insecure, uh, that we are not teaching consent and healthy relationships in sex and relationship classes in school, that workplaces don't have reporting tools, all of these, you know, amazing things that we need to be doing, um, including the Istanbul Convention and all sorts of other um, conventions that we need to sign up to. It's just, let's get more police, let's increase policing powers, let's introduce 500 new women's places in prisons, even though all the research shows that that is not what you should be doing. And that's what the government has always has also admitted to. Um, and I think that we need more people in politics who have that kind of politics to look beyond policing uh, to solve the issues that are deeply structural. Everyone's frozen. How, or are they just silent? Sorry. We're not frozen. <laughs> <laughs> We're just struck. We're struck by your words. Um, no, I was just, because uh, I saw a question earlier that reminded me of what you were saying, so I was trying to find it. Um, and again, this goes to anyone. Um, someone has asked, in moving beyond the police, something often people say is that this kind of abolition is airy-fairy and wishy-washy and unrealistic in practice. How do you respond to that? Um, when trying to argue to, for to move beyond the police? I mean, I can take that and I can take that with the caveat that, look, I think abolition throws down a really interesting challenge to old human rights institutions like liberty. And we definitely, there's still conversations that liberty has to have and our 10,000 members need to have about where we might stand on abolition. But a human rights analysis also, if you're going to look at whether or not something is that interferes with human rights should happen, you know, often with qualified rights, the analysis that you do is you go, well, is it lawful? Is there a law that lets you do it? Is legitimate? Is it legitimate? I, is it an effective means of reaching a legitimate aim? And finally, is it proportionate? And in that, you have to look at, are there less restrictive options? And this is where I see the interesting convergence between human rights and what you know, a lot of abolitionist campaigners are saying. Because what we're really asking is, what are the alternatives and why haven't we considered them? And is what we have actually effective? You know, I find it really fascinating that you know, it's kind of taboo to even ask, but is this working? Will this prevent the harm in the future? Or is it, like, if you want it to be a deterrent, is it actually deterring people? Like, we don't even, before you even get to abolition, we don't even have those questions in kind of boring human rights terms. Um, and I think what we really have to do is, you know, we get stuck in these very boring, but very trapping false binaries, whereby we get to, well, it's prison or nothing, well, it's policing or nothing. And actually it, it becomes to be to ask, but what if there was something? What if we just wanted to talk about it? What if we wanted to explore it? What if somebody wanted to pilot it, right? All of that, all of a sudden becomes very scary to people um, but actually that's what people are calling for when they're saying defund this and invest in this they're asking where are the alternatives and I think that the pandemic has really shone a light on that and that was why Liberty that's why we did that protect everyone bill as an alternative to the coronavirus act because that kind of really trapping lockdown skeptic or lockdown supporter binary it became well either you support more police powers and more fines or you support leaving people behind and the virus going everywhere. And what we weren't having a conversation was about how might we support people without punishing them to comply with public health guidance? Why don't we talk about unsafe workplaces and how we enforce against them? Why don't we talk about providing accommodation for people to isolate outside of their homes? Why don't we talk about proper sick pay? Um, you know, so we get trapped in these binaries. And as I say, you know, I. There's a lot that, that the human rights movement can be in conversation with when it comes to abolition. And I think really it comes down to why are we trapped with only these things or nothing? Why aren't we talking about the alternatives? We should all be able to agree on that. Thanks. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add on this point of abolition and moving, moving beyond the idea of the police? Do you wanna, do you wanna go Moya? I was I gonna say no, yeah, you go, you go, Luke, you go. Okay, so what, what, what I was going to say is that this idea that we're talking abolition or we're talking prisons and stuff like that ignores the big sort of elephant in the room. And the fact is that, you know, the current prison system doesn't work. 
Like you're ignoring the big elephant in the room where you go, oh yeah, it must be prison or this. It's because it literally doesn't work. If I'm experiencing hate crime and I'm not, and I get murdered in the streets, right? My family, when they put that that murderer in prison, when he gets out, they're not necessarily safer. Because if, if he gets out and he's likely to reoffend, well, that hasn't made me another person like me not experience murder, if you get what well, it hasn't really protected anybody. So we need to talk about, you know, a criminal justice system that actually works. And I've got sort of an answer to the previous speaker that I think, you know, they might be kind of tied up and they might not be able to go into a bit more detail um, because of their positions and things. But what I would say is, is... Um, it's, it's about crim criminality. Like, you can't fill up, you know, the pockets of Serco and G4S with abolitionist solutions. You can't farm people in prisons for cheap labour with abolitionist you know, thing. And let's look at who's going to run all these secure, you know, secure schools and all this you know, stuff. You know, it's academy chains, you know, Harris Academy and all the rest of them. Crooks is what I call them, frankly. Um, and G4S and every Serco, all, you know, all the Tories mates. That's why they love prisons. It's not because they do anything or keep anyone safe. It's because they can farm us all for money. And let's talk about why is why is everybody in prison, right? They're, they're, you know, the law doesn't apply to everybody equally. Rich people are already getting away with everything. So, you know, real, more legislation only applies to us at the bottom, frankly speaking. Um, and I think we need to talk about that more. Um, the fact that it's racialized groups, minorities in prison. And it's not because we're more inherently criminal. And this idea that Pretty Patel goes on the board of deputies and goes, you know, gypsies and travelers are all biologically predisposed to crime. It's like, well, most crime, like I'm not saying all of it, but most crime is because of economic situations, socioeconomic situations. The fact that people are in, you know, um, sort of risky work or work that, you know, is is precarious and you know all these sorts of issues and that that's why people go oh i can't feed my child i'm gonna you know steal baby formula and people get criminalized for stealing baby formula in a proper society with this amount of money we should, that that person would never see a prison they wouldn't even see the justice system so yeah i think we need to think about those sorts of things and look i always say this right how can police save us when you know, communities like us, people only looked around and said the prison system and everything like that. You know, it's only a problem now that white women are getting their necks need on, uh, putting people's knees on them and things like that. When we saw, uh, you know, the vigil and stuff. Um, it's like communities like mine have had this the whole time. Um, it shouldn't just be shocking when it's, uh, you know, a, a white university student or whatever. This should be shocking all the way around. And um I also think on an abolition perspective, and I don't want to take up too much time, but I just want to mention sex workers, because at the minute there's a Labour MP that is intent on criminalising sex workers, right? Well, criminalising their clients. So it's actually more nefarious than that. And sex workers have come along and said, this will get women killed. Right. And this is a Yorkshire MP. And we know what happened in Yorkshire. We don't need to go through and give everyone the trauma. Right. I think that's personally and it's not for me as a man to say, but I personally think that's a disgrace, frankly. Um, and we know that putting sex workers more to do with the police, where the police are more likely to be abusers, things like this. Um, it puts women in danger. So I think we need to talk about the fact that legislation can't always solve the problems that legislation actually creates in the first place um so let's not forget people like sex workers either and make sure that you know we don't forget them because at the end of the day they're the people that experience a lot of the lion's share of you know male violence as well let's be frank um and when people like kill people they tend to be victims a lot too so it's it's really awful but um so we need to listen to people who are actually affected like if the government listened to people from my community and told them the solutions we wouldn't be in this case where they're going to try and take our children away and make us homeless and take all our assets away um so yeah thank you brilliant thank you i'll go to you next moyo and i was just looking in the chat at the different questions and and so while you're answering, thinking about what alternatives to prison do, w would you suggest be put in place for offenders who present kind of serious threat to members of society? Well, I don't know if I'm best placed to answer this because I don't work with offenders who pose a serious threat to society. Um, and I can't speak for the successes of processes that I would normally talk about, which is, you know, like transformative justice. Um, 
But all I know is that the current, as Luke has pointed out, and as as I pointed out on the panel, that the current um, castle system we exist in doesn't stop reoffending in that sense, and it's not fit for purpose. And there must be something better than this that serves both the community um, and maybe can lead to rehabilitation. But I. I I don't think that I am best placed to answer that question, to be honest, because I wouldn't want to just like speak on it if I didn't have the full breadth of knowledge around uh, what that would look like in terms of serious offenders, as we're terming it. No worries. Unless anyone else has any thoughts on that, I'll move on to some of the other questions. OK, so ahead of this panel, we also had a lot of um, questions on, on how to actually stop this bill and how to organise. Um, and so one of them was for Zara. As the Tories have a majority, do you actually believe there is a chance of stopping this bill in terms of um, processes in Parliament? So, like, like the question mentions, the Tories have this majority and they can pass absolutely anything that they want. It passed its second reading on the 16th of March, 359 votes to 263. And we know that the the consecutive parts of the process were meant to take place quite quickly after that but the large-scale mo mobilizations have delayed it um, which shows that there is power in the streets to really affect the way that this bill's process in parliament plays out um, while you know like, let's be honest they can pass it in the next stages quite easily they can ignore everything that's happening but what we need to do is continue mobilizing on numbers that effectively make it unworkable and we've seen this in the past with the poll tax and the way I would say it is the power of protest is going to have to be the thing that defends the right to protest so the mobilizations that we're seeing weekly there's um, on the 1st of May more demonstrations there's the one in London we've got one in Coventry and across the country as well we just need to make sure that we're building those coalitions we're talking to people in our community we're coming out in force we're doing all the stuff that you also have to do with your MPs especially I would say conservative MPs that have marginals um, if, if people you know are constituents of those MPs exert your pressure those MPs are you know meant to serve you they're meant to work for you make them earn that vote or whatever um, and not just wait until elections to to demonstrate that so I think it's really important that we exercise all means um, and especially you know uh, mobilizing in, in in communities and in demonstrations Thank you. And in the chat as well, one of the questions was, how can the general public be persuaded that the bill is an extreme breach of um, democratic rights, um, especially if most of the general public don't care about this or they don't have the capacity to bother about this? Um, what kind of arguments would you use? Um, anyone? <laughs> I'd actually, I, I mean, maybe Pollen will prove me wrong here, but I, I feel like maybe the message is getting through that it is uh, you know, an extreme breach of democratic rights. The, I would say this bill is so terrible, so all-encompassing of every sort of issue across the spectrum that you could think of. As Gracie said earlier, kind of it puts together um, several different initiatives that the Home Office been trying to drive through in terms of punitive punishing, that the general public are already slightly listening. The fact we've seen such mass widespread protests. Um, I think the thing to focus on if you're trying to convince a non-believer as it were which is difficult is again that idea of being free to move around public space so one of these things one of the things that i think we've touched upon a bit with this bill but maybe haven't nailed down is that what it really seeks to do is change the way we move as citizens through public space it's you know criminalizing nomadic communities and but criminalizing that space that idea of trespass the idea that we can't you know you can't go into a certain area especially in like the countryside or fields or whatever in the city as well it would further show up the sort of pseudo public spaces that have been popping up so you know you never know when you're actually trespassing anymore because something looks like a public square and then you find out find out it's owned by this shadowy um, co property company and it's subject to all kinds of bylaws that you aren't even aware of. So I think I think that is like, sadly, the, the idea of the encroachment on that public right to just be in space and not be um, criminalised. It's, it's, but I think we're already seeing the public have realised how deep this goes. Um, and it's sad that it's taken something so extreme. It is sad that it's taken something so extreme for them to even sort of wake up and and clock that. 
but yeah I think I think it's the focus again on that idea of being able to exist in in public move around public space have that right to just go about your business or express any sort of dissent and you know stress that the chipping away of these rights means that in if if this bill goes through in 10 years or so in your 20 years you have the next generation coming through the things that we see as normal now or even that are starting to be encroached upon like the right to protest the right to move around the right to you know walk through a field and not be cuffed um that will that will not seem normal anymore that sort of like freedom will not seem normal and that's the freedom that we have to tell people we are protecting um so yeah those are the things i said we should focus on but if if it was obviously an ideal world we'd be focusing on the harm it's doing to marginalized groups but unfortunately as it's been pointed out in the chat then a lot of the general public are just trying to keep their head above water and don't have time for do extending all their empathy if I can come in on that, I think we also need to draw broader links. So like I mentioned earlier, there's this broader context to the authoritarianism. We've seen conservative supporters be installed as the chairman of the BBC. We've seen anti-migrant rhetoric um, from the get go from this government. We've, we've heard proposals of putting gunships in the channel to deter um, asylum seekers. And we've heard plans to put asylum seekers miles away on an island, like what they do in Australia. Also new voter ID laws with which would disproportionately affect Gypsy Roman traveler communities and other marginalized groups uh, because they want to suppress turnout of um, working class people who are statistically more likely to be voting labor. Um, there's also the redrawing of constituency boundaries, again, to rig more votes in their favor. And all of this, especially I think with this bill, it's setting the, the, the groundwork for what's to come. So while we're going through this moment of social and economic crisis because of the pandemic, we know that the climate crisis is the biggest crisis of them all. And um, as we see more of that play out in our daily lives, it's happening already. Uh, but when we see the unemployment grow um, and, and be, you know, one the worst in generations, we're going to see more people want to come out to the streets, want to organise. And this is the government essentially, essentially preparing for that. So that new police power was essentially quell that dissent. And um, this is this is essentially just the starting point of that. And I think it's really important that people um, are, are made aware of those things, that this is them preparing for what is to come. And we need to prepare on a scale that's even bigger, essentially. Thanks. Um, okay, so I'm just seeing what other um, audience questions came in. Uh, one of them was around the fact that the bill was slightly delayed. Um, and I'd, again, anyone can answer this. Do you feel like this is something we should be celebrating? Is this a good thing? Or is this another kind of stall tactic um, because of all the protests? I think we need to celebrate wins wherever we find them because it's an incredibly bleak uh, place we find ourselves in and there is a direct correlation between what we saw at Clapham Common and the vigil uh, and the demonstration straight after that and what happened in Parliament there was an outpouring of anger um, you know and, and Gaudem and Tribune and other um, left media and alternative media covered it before a lot of mainstream media did they didn't want to talk about um, a lot of the issues so I think we need to celebrate what that what that moment achieved but also knowing that the work didn't end there we can't just pack our bags and say we're done um, because the, the process is not over and we need to keep building momentum um, and know that the, it will come back to parliament and we need to be preparing for that as well but also beyond the parliamentary process which is what instigated a lot of this anyway. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Gracie, I saw, saw you shaking your head or nodding your head. <laughs> no, not nodding, not shaking. I mean, Zara is absolutely right. It is, it is a win. It's a win to be celebrated. Um, I suppose I'm just thinking about um, what I'm thinking about is the extent to which thing, this bit, the edges are taken off this bill, but what happens more broadly? Because I think what I'm really interested in is how do we get to a place where bringing forward this kind of legislation is just political, politically untenable? That, that's what I'm interested in. Um, because I think, as I've said already, this when you look at, you know, this bill is ostensibly and when you look at all the press releases that came out about it initially, which are fascinating because it's literally covered as a bill to, um, you know, stop child sex abuse. 
you know, and those parts of the bill are com completely commendable, but why you would package them up, well, we know why you would package them up with the rest of it, but like that wasn't what this, this bill was badged as about being about safer communities. And when you look at what this bill says about safety, it's, it's saying pretty loudly who, who the bill's intended to keep safe from who. So what I'm interested in is how we get to a place where a bill like this is not what is understood by politicians to be community safety. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to the parliamentary process, you know, there are going to be some areas where there's cross-party consensus and where I think there is scope for wins, but the worst excesses and the worst bits of this bill, I mean, Luke, I see you shaking your head. I think there are conservative backbenchers that will support on protest, um, but that is that is about it. Um, I think the, the worst bits, you know, the bits that are really gunning for marginalised communities, they're not going to come out for. When we look at the article that Steve Baker and Dominic Grieve joined forces to write for Conservative Home or Politics Home, um, it was very much, you know, real concerns about protest all this stuff on unauthorised encampments totally justified, right? So we already see where those parliamentary coalitions are going to be. Um, and that's why, while I want people to continue to mobilise, and I think it's really important, what I'm really interested in is the movement um, that outlasts and outlives this bill and makes bills like this in the future politically impossible. That's what I'm really interested in. Go on, Luke. I know you want to respond. Yeah, I do. I do want to a bit. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually agree with that. Like pretty much everything that was just said. But I, I do want to. I do want to say on this idea of basically what this is going towards is is an authoritarian police state, and this is like a sort of enabling act in what 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 they're doing now. And I just kind of wanted to say, you know, about sort of reaching out to people, making a broad coalition, and things like that. I don't think this needs to be. As much, it don't need to be as big as people think. I think trade unions getting behind this, the members of trade unions would be big enough to bring this country to its knees and stop this bill going through. Um, the truth is, is that I think they also need to realise is that this idea that, oh yeah, there's COVID regulations, so we can't go out and protest and things like that. They need to realise that this government doesn't have the ordinary decorum that normal governments have. It doesn't have that. And they need to really wisen up this. And the charities are finding out very quickly, and they've been threatened, the Running Me Trust and everybody else is being threatened at the minute to shut up about this bill, about the race report and everything else. So I think we need to, to we don't have to say, oh, you know, gypsies and travellers are the most popular people ever. And that's why we need to campaign on this bill. I, like, I'm not, we're not sort of, um, yeah, I'm not in any other sort of illusion that we're a popular community. And I'm not saying go and campaign on us. But all I would say is you need to explain to people that um, this is how they work, is that they pick off communities and they blame it because we're we're facing a new gilded age at the minute where in the next 10 years, we're potentially going to have trillionaires, not billionaires, trillionaires. And they used to have this economic thing, you know, the economy is going well with Margaret Thatcher or whatever. People are owning more homes and then they, they, they create a consensus that way. Well, our economy is actually deflating more heavily than most other economies. And they're actually afraid, my, my personal opinion is that they're afraid of the 2010 riots, but on a mass scale. When people start, you know, when this all comes to crunch and people can't, you know, feed their families as well as they could, mass unemployment. Um, I think they're tooling up to deal with that sort of situation. And I think it needs to be said that um, they have to blame minorities. And when they're finished with my minority, when they're finished with my community, they will have to find other communities. And the truth is, is because they once they've started, they have to keep feeding people to the machine. And because once they have nobody to feed to the machine, there's only them left to blame for all society's ills. So they have to find minorities, trans people, sex workers, gypsies and travellers, migrants, all of these things. Um, and we need to explain to ordinary people that, you know, not just people that are racialized groups or I get I guess I say ordinary I mean that's kind of a dodgy word but I guess we've been trained to think that we're not ordinary even though we are um but that's a different discussion I guess it's like internalized racism but um we need to explain that once they're finished with us it'll be another group and they have to keep going because they're not just going to say oh it was us that did it all because then they'll be voted out of power and that doesn't make any sense so they have to keep finding like the bogeyman in society basically and i think once you explain that to a lot of people they have a lot more sympathy um for it uh but you know the NGOs and the trade unions, like I say, they are going to need to eventually, they are going to be on the chopping board and it's not just going to be their funding, it's going to be them all together. Um, 
and that's what we're starting to experience. And like these people whose organisations it is to hold the government account on race and equality are now not even allowed to do that. Like what sort of society does that say? Um, yeah, like we are going towards a, a fascist police state and um, it, it's pretty awful and people really do need to be made aware. <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, one of the okay so we'll be wrapping up shortly and i'm just trying to get through some of the final questions um one from earlier was um whether panelists anyone feels like this would have happened whether this bill would have gone through had it not been for the public health crisis i know you mentioned earlier zara how it was pushed through parliament um do you think that it provided the per perfect kind of smoke screen would it have ha happened anyway I think the pandemic has provided a smoke screen to a lot of anti-human rights, civil liberties legislation. But this Conservative government, like Luke and others have mentioned, isn't like others that we've experienced before. Um, we've seen right wing Tories before, but this party has been completely purged of any one nation Tory um, Toryism um, following Brexit. So this is a party uh, that is very much the most right wing. I mean, I'm not a historian, but I would say at least I can use my lifetime as an example um, to say that uh, the most right wing that we've ever had. And they think of themselves above accountability, above anyone else. We've seen that with the contracts that they've been giving out. We've seen that with the communications, the, the kind of uh, sleaze that people are using. If it was any other country, we'd be using the word corruption, but there's a legal implication there. So we're not uh, basically. Um, and, and all of these things tell you exactly what this government thinks of the people that live here, but also of themselves and their friends and their chums. Um, so they would have done it anyway. They would have passed this legislation because it is purely ideological. We were talking about, you know, why when we're talking about safeguarding and well-being, do we always end up, you know, talking about more policing or, you know, all of these things that have um, social economic kind of solutions? Why do we always turn to kind of uh, more kind of authoritarian like I like uh, policies, it's because they are pursuing an ideological um, mandate here or agenda anyway, and that's that's literally fueling it. So, and that will be the case until uh, I would say we have a change of government, uh, but also until we really change the way we do politics in this country. Um, I, I'm knocking on doors still now and people are still like, yeah, I, I'm not interested in politics, but I, it doesn't affect me. And I think as, as a Labour Party MP and as someone who has a background in community organising and now that my party is getting rid of the community organising unit, um, I think that is a huge failure because that's how we build power. Power isn't in Westminster. It's not in those lobbies or whatever. It's with ordinary people. And that's how they, they're able to maintain their kind of status quo because everyone else is too, wor too worried because they're working those precarious jobs that Luke mentioned. They're not able to feed their kids. They're, we've become a nation of food banks and zero hour contracts. And that's what allows the rest of this bullshit essentially to continue. Thanks. OK, so before we wrap up, a quick go around. Um, do you feel confident that this bill will be defeated? Any final words? Um, optimistic, pessimistic? <laughs> Difficult. I think the people united will never be defeated. <laughs> That's probably what I'd have to say. Uh, I think we have a fighting chance, you know. I think we have more of a fighting chance than we've had of any sort of piece of legislation in the last five years. And that gives me hope. Um, as I said before, I think it's such an this beach is beach. This bill is such an overreach of um, punitive policing powers and such an expansion that it has managed to piss off people from every single sort of marginalised group. And we talked a bit about that coalition that we've got to build, and we are building. Um, and I think Luke brilliantly highlighted how you know the the Tory tactics and the tactics of fascists that is just picking off different groups um, and pitting them against each other. But this bill has maybe finally I'm seeing the kernels of people actually coming together and being like, you know what, we've got to stand in solidarity. And that's something I've, I've seen at all the protests. So on the basis of that, I'm going to say never give up hope. And as Gracie was talking about, whatever's ignited from this, carry that through. Because the only way we're going to win this battle in the long term is that coalition um, and making sure we see the commonalities between our struggles and stand in solidarity with everyone who is penalised by the state, by this government, um, and just by the sort of like late stage capitalism hell we live in. Thanks. Okay, Gracie. 
Yeah, I mean, look, as someone who's had a foot in activist spaces and another foot and most of my head in policy spaces for the last five years, I mean, this is the most exciting mobilization about a piece of legislation that I've ever seen. It's not like I have a long career, but like it's really exciting. This is the kind of thing where when you look at a piece of draft legislation and you think, oh, my goodness, this has got some really horrible bits in it. Yes, we will communicate about it, but is anyone going to care? Like, it's an amazing, it's amazing to see the mobilization. Um, and it's really, I'm really heartened by the work that people have done actually to insist it's not just protest, it's all these other bits of the bill as well, because that's the thing that often gets lost when you're dealing with legislation is people will fixate on, you know, the bit that's most palatable um, and the bit that's in theory got the broadest appeal and everything else gets um, gets left by the wayside. And I mean, I am. Um, I haven't watched a parliamentary debate live since like 2017 when I cried at the state of what was going on with the data protection bill and migrants just getting thrown under the bus. So, I mean, that's like this. That's exciting, right? It's exciting, um, even if it is in the face of um, something really grim. And, you know, the other thing that I think in terms of the more general context that Zara, you've spoken to and I've spoken about in terms of this war on accountability and war on the mechanisms that we use to hold power to account, I mean, it is also the state running scared. It's because those mechanisms work that the state is running scared that this government has brought this legislation. So I think, you know, the, the, all of it is a signal to the fact that collectively we are powerful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll take heart from that. As I've said, I, in terms of a very dry parliamentary coalition, what's gonna happen with amendments, um, I don't have huge confidence on all aspects of the worst bits of the bill. Um, but I'm always very open to being surprised. You can't do this job and become cynical because you, you just become awful or you have to leave. So you can't be cynical. Um, and we've just seen the work of freedom from torture and others um, push the government into this massive climb down. Yes, albeit on decriminalizing torture, a climb down nonetheless with an eight seat majority, you know, let's take it. So um, yeah, shoulders to the wheel um, and let's keep up the fight. Sarah, Luke, any final words? I would want to echo everything that Maya, Moya and Gracie have said about keeping hope. I think if you become um, too uh, I don't know, pessimistic, um, it becomes incredibly difficult to work in these spaces. So we have to we have to be hopeful. And I am incredibly hopeful um, at being at the demonstrations, seeing how young, how diverse, you know, people from all backgrounds really, really angry about this. And, you know, I actually with the, with the previous two bills that happened, um, speaking up against them in Parliament and kind of just doing that stuff and them passing, this bill feels different. Um, there has been a reaction to it that has been very different. There has been the reaction by this by the government that has been very different. They've ignored the rest of you know the, the criticisms, although you know they're making some exemptions now because of some of the, the the outrage. But that gives me hope, and I think we have to keep building while this is possibly going to pass. We have to make sure it's unworkable. We need to be preparing for what's to come. And like Gracie said, you know, the movement um, is, is something that is long lasting. Um, it, it doesn't, you know, exist because of, of parliament and because of laws It exists because the people need movements to fight for their rights regardless. So I think it's really important that we, we are building. And I think, you know, one thing to learn um, from being on the left and being in the Labour Party is that maybe um, some of the lessons that we should learn from the previous past few years were how we might have neglected movement building and support in grassroots mobilizations and grassroots organizing um, and putting all of our eggs in one basket when it comes to parliamentary um, mechanisms. So I think it's, a, it's, it's something to uh, be conscious of, uh, but also knowing that we have to work with both, both sides of the coin. Okay, Luke, you've got like 30 seconds. Yeah, I'll be super quick. So all I wanted to say was the fact is, right, is that we're often some of the first to be targeted by regimes like this, but we're never the last. So remember that you are always potentially going to be there. I was demoralised by seeing Tory MPs and MPs get up driving the stake in further against my community. I was absolutely demoralised. And Sisters Uncut came out of absolutely nowhere, reached out to our community and showed us the light, basically. When have you ever seen gypsies and travellers in the streets, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder with um, Black Lives Matter, trans people, sex workers, everybody out in the street together, trade unionists, literally everybody right we don't need that many people to bring this government you know bring this bill down 
Right. So there's the hope there. Um, so, yeah, get out in the streets and show them where to shove this bill, basically. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so thanks for having me. Thanks so much. I'm glad it kind of ended on a on a positive note. Um, so thanks so much to everyone for joining this debate um, and to all our panelists and our audience. Thank you, Moya, um, Zara, Gracie and Luke uh, for taking time out of your day to talk about this issue. Um, and with all of these panelists, uh, follow them on Twitter, watch their updates about the bill um, and keep updated. And uh, we hope to see you next week. We do have a weekly debate, um, so you can check our website and our social media. Um, and my colleague will put the link in the chat to the live discussions. We also have a weekly newsletter um, and Open Democracy does rely on contributions and donations. So if you want to see more public interest journalism like this, please do consider supporting Open Democracy. Um, and thank you again. Hopefully see you all next week.